how does the soul become free? This is uh, an age-old question. Um, perhaps it's kind of the question. And um, to begin to offer my proposed answer to it, according to my system of transcendental Kabbalah, um, I'll first point out that when we're talking about the soul's freedom, we have to think about two different types of freedom. Um, there is the freedom that is derived from social emancipation, so freedom from uh, social slavery in the form of ideology and uh, oppression of various sorts. And then there is a kind of, I guess you could say, individual emancipation, which needs to be understood in terms of mental health. So how, how does one become free from complexes, um, psychological complexes? And the kind of really difficult uh, thing to untangle in addressing this question is how to talk about both of both mental health emancipation and social emancipation at the same time. Because it's fairly clear that in some sense they're related, that sort of social oppression uh, perhaps either creates or at least sustains and kind of uh, ramifies or uh, exacerbates certain types of uh, emotional slavery or whatever in order to sustain the current order. Now, with that in mind, uh, this is why, in my view, there are three potential states of freedom of the soul in the soul's ascension from slavery to freedom. And you can see these on the album cover to HAQQ. They are the Hyperborean, the Transcendental, and the Hylogenic. And essentially, the Hyperborean is the enslaved state of the soul. So it's a soul that is unable to grow, um, unable to understand what its own interests and its own aims are. Um, and the transcendental is a kind of minimal amount of freedom where perhaps, perhaps the soul is free um, emotionally, but it's not free socially or vice versa, or it's a little bit more complicated than that, I guess, actually. What I mean to say is that it's a soul that is perhaps able to um, have its activity autonomously emanate from its inner drive, uh, whether for emotional or social reasons, but not in such a way that it's able to legitimately pierce the veil of contemporary social ideology, which means that in short, it's not able to change the world. It's not able to change the course of history and direct it away from uh, the kind of dissipating effects of advanced capitalism. And so to achieve um, what I just described, a form of freedom that actually sort of exercises agency um, over world history, you know, in, in some small way, obviously, but sort of um, is able to go against the current of dissolution in culture. Uh, to be hyligenically free is to see heaven. Uh, to see Heiligen. And uh, that is in some sense to see God or to see 
the divine aspect of human nature. And what is required in order to see God is a kind of multivalent praxis that is part um, religious discipline, part abstract uh, kind of philosophical metaphysics and uh, kind of discursive philosophy of history and sort of just everything that's discursive about philosophy to kind of have, have an account of um, the nature of all things, being in history and so forth. Um, and it is part uh, dramatic in the sense that it requires a practical intervention into the fabric of society, of the social bond, that has an aesthetic character. Um, and when those three uh, practices are sort of combined and uh, work in a self-sustaining way, I, I call that perichoresis. And that creates a kind of pocket of life or of culture Again, maybe not necessarily a big one, maybe one that just has a few people in it, but um, there's no reason why it can't be scalable uh, that is free from ideology. Ideology is not just conceptual, it's also affective, um, meaning that it also is at the level of habits and feelings. And so generally, like, the feeling of being caught up in the kind of social currents surrounding any particular cultural practice um, in the kind of current social regime, um, I would argue is ultimately ideological. That uh, to, to, to say this in a, in a word, maybe I could do a longer video on just this topic, but it requires a sense of fundamental alienation from every discursive regime within which one is operating, which is difficult to do. Um, but in my view, hylogenic freedom requires that. It requires a really kind of fundamental alienation, um, but an alienation that is also connected and involved, so not, not a closed-off alienation. Um, so a lot more could be said about exactly what constitutes the hyperborean, the transcendental, and the hylogenic. The last thing I'll just say is that the, the elements of the soul that are in play are called Kelvalhal, Rainer Ray, and the Genesis Call, which loosely correspond to, let's say, the will, the imagination, and the intellect from the perspective of classical philosophy, or they correspond to the ego, sorry, the id, respectively, ego and superego, in psychoanalysis, um, and... There are, anyway, that, that's kind of an, another can of worms too, but there, there are, there's this, there's this human trinity that uh, sort of appears in different lights from different um, standpoints of knowledge. And so to kind of, to kind of designate that whole cluster of uh, views on these, on, on these three entities, there's always three is the thing. I, I give them proper names. Genesis call Kelval Hall and Ray. And um, let's say that in short, we're calling them will, intellect, and imagination, although it's kind of so much more than that. Um, you know, essentially, the, the default state of a human being is to have all three of those entities serving the world, the fallen, sinful world. And 
the first of the three that can break out of that is the will, which is the Genesis call when it makes contact with Olalan, which is the divine feminine, essentially, and the kind of uh, spiritual heartbeat of humanity. And uh, I think that the most important avenue from the fallen state of Genesis call towards the one that is uh, fed by Olalan's light is a religious ascesis. Um, so it, it, it requires genuinely religious practices like prayer and um, acts of kindness and maybe meditative practices. And then once one has made contact with God's will, then the imagination and the intellect can gradually uh, release their grip on the world and begin to sort of bolster the will in its service of Olalan. Um, and that can take an entire lifetime. 